Imagine this, the beginning of 1941, the United States government in a bold move pledges to construct a whopping 200 merchant ships. This commitment is nothing short of a lifeline, a beacon of hope for the Allies in the Atlantic, fighting tooth and nail against the Axis forces. Despite the distance America has made it clear, they stand with the Allies. Back home the nation is in a state of mixed emotions, some citizens are filled with patriotic pride, others are consumed by fear, worried about the looming war. Across the Atlantic reactions are equally varied. Churchill breathes a sigh of relief, while Hitler's brow furrows in frustration. This ambitious endeavor doesn't come cheap. The cost is astronomical, a testament to the lengths the US is willing to go to support their allies. And with that, the tides of war began to stir, the world watching, holding its breath. Meanwhile, on January 15th, a fierce determination grips the Australian army as they initiate actions against the Italians in Libya. This wasn't a spur-of-the-moment decision. Rather, it was a calculated move born out of strategic necessity and a commitment to support the Allies. Australia wasn't alone in this endeavor. The British forces joined them, a testament to their shared resolve to push back against the Axis powers. The Australian deployment was no small feat. Thousands of soldiers, a formidable arsenal of weaponry, and a fleet of vehicles were dispatched to Libya, a clear sign of their intent to make a significant impact on the war. The decision to take a more aggressive stance was fueled by the escalating tension and the need to protect their interests. This was a pivotal moment, a show of strength and solidarity that would have far-reaching implications. With courage in their hearts, the Australians stood firm, ready to face whatever lay ahead. January 22nd, a date marked in history as the Allies seized Tobruk, a strategic port city crucial for North African operations. Tobruk, a Mediterranean jewel, was wrestled from the grip of Italian forces in a fierce battle. This strategic port was more than just a city, it was a lifeline. Sitting on the edge of Libya, Tobruk was the gateway to the vast desert terrain of North Africa. Its capture meant that the Allies had an open door to the heartland of the Axis powers in Africa. Imagine the vast stretches of desert, the unforgiving sun, the relentless winds. Now imagine controlling the key to traverse this harsh landscape. That's what Tobruk offered the Allies, a chance to shift the tide of the war. Tobruk, once a symbol of enemy power, now a beacon of hope for the Allies. This victory was not just a conquest of land, but a triumph of will and strategic brilliance. The same day, an astounding victory for the Allies, Operation Compass concludes with a staggering 130,000 Italian prisoners captured. This monumental end to Operation Compass left the Allies with a conundrum, where to place the influx of prisoners. Amidst logistical complexities, Mussolini grappled with the scale of the defeat, his once formidable forces now significantly diminished. In the face of such a massive defeat, the Axis powers could only reel in shock. A week later, high-level talks between the British and the Americans result in fortified ties between the nations. Key figures meet clandestinely, their identities shrouded in secrecy. This clandestine rendezvous, somewhere cloaked in the shadows of the world stage, these discussions held in secret would prove to be a turning point in the war. Yet, on that same day, British forces engaged Italian positions in Kenya. Under the leadership of General Cunningham and General Bergonzoli, each side, armed with strength and determination, clashed fiercely. As dust settled over the battlefield, the world waited, wondering what the next move would be. Picture this, February 1st, 1941. The United States, though not yet in the war, was gearing up for the inevitable. The U.S. Navy, an embodiment of American power and resilience, underwent a significant reorganization. It formed three independent fleets, each with its own strategic mission and leadership. The Atlantic Fleet, under the command of Admiral Ernest King, was a formidable force poised to protect the East Coast and the North Atlantic shipping lanes. Meanwhile, Admiral Husband Kimmel commanded the Pacific Fleet, safeguarding the West Coast and the Pacific Islands. The third, the Asia-Pacific Fleet, under Admiral Thomas Hart, was a strategic move to counter potential threats in the Far East. This reorganization wasn't just about ships and sailors. It was a chess move on the global board a silent indication that the U.S. was preparing for a war it was not yet officially part of. With this strategic move, the U.S. was silently preparing for a war it was not yet officially part of. Fast forward to Valentine's Day, 1941, a day of love turned into a day of strategic military agreements. Bulgaria, a country strategically placed, 
found itself in the crosshairs of the world's most powerful armies. The situation was tense with the imminent invasion of Greece on the horizon. Germany, eager to secure its southern flank, turned its gaze to Bulgaria. Bulgaria, however, was not a willing participant in this game of chess. The nation was caught between a rock and a hard place, pressured by Germany to allow its soil to be used as a launch pad for the invasion. The number of German troops stationed in Bulgaria was substantial, with the country practically swarming with foreign military presence. This was no ordinary agreement. It was a decision made under duress, a decision that would forever alter the course of Bulgaria's history. This agreement marked a significant shift in the power dynamics of the region. On that very same Valentine's Day, thousands of miles away in Tripoli, Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps arrived. It was Hitler himself who dispatched Rommel, a move that hinted at his fears about Mussolini's ability to hold Africa independently. Rommel didn't come alone. He brought with him a force of seasoned soldiers and a vast array of equipment, ready to reinforce the faltering Italian forces. This move was a clear indication of Hitler's intentions in Africa. A few days later, from February 19th to 23rd, Allied authorities convened in Cairo. Amid the shadows of the pyramids, a grave decision was made. 100,000 British soldiers were to join the fight in Greece. They would be bolstering an existing force standing shoulder to shoulder with their Greek allies. The looming threat was clear and present. An invasion could break upon Greece's shores at any moment. This commitment was a clear signal of the Allies' determination to defend Greece at all costs. Picture this. It's March 5, 1941. The sun rises over the Egyptian shores as the first elements of British reinforcements board their vessels, bound for the Balkan front. This isn't just a simple change of station. No, this is a crucial tactical move in the grand chessboard of war. The Balkan front is a key battlefield, a gateway to the heart of Europe. The British forces, fueled by a sense of duty and a thirst for victory, set sail from the land of pharaohs. Their destination? A land embroiled in conflict, a region crying out for assistance. These brave men and women are the lifeblood of the Allied resistance in the Balkans. Their mission? To turn the tide of the war. The stakes are high, the tension palpable. As the sun sets, the British forces are en route, unaware of the challenges and battles that lay ahead. Just a few days later on March 9th, the Italians, determined and resolute, launch a new offensive in Greece. Seized by a burning desire to reclaim their lost territories, the Italian forces spring into action. The previous months had been tough, marked by a series of battles that saw the Italians losing ground to the Greeks. Now they were ready to turn the tables. Their new offensive was more than just a military operation. It was a statement of intent, a bold declaration that they were not yet out of the game. The Italians were fighting not just for territory, but also for pride and prestige. Their losses had been a blow to their morale, but they were ready to push back to show their mettle. The Greek terrain was challenging, the odds were stacked against them, but the Italians were undeterred. They were ready for the challenge. The Italians, driven by a desire to regain their position, plunge headfirst into a new offensive, setting the stage for a fierce struggle. Across the Atlantic on March 11th, President Roosevelt takes a pen to paper, signing the Land Lease Act into law. This significant piece of legislation allowed the United States to militarily support its allies, even with delayed payments. This wasn't just about money, no. This was a pledge of commitment, a promise of solidarity in the face of an overwhelming enemy. Roosevelt's decision was a calculated move, a strategic maneuver, if you will. It was a way to secure the United States' interests abroad without directly entering the war. It was a way to provide aid to those in need, without overextending the nation's resources. The Land Lease Act was more than just a piece of paper. It was a lifeline extended to nations under siege. It was the United States stepping up, showing that they were ready to support their allies in the fight against the Axis powers. With a single signature, the United States pledges its support, altering the dynamics of World War II. Fast forward to March 21st, in a bold move, Yugoslav Air Force personnel overthrow Prince Paul. This unexpected turn of events was fueled by a myriad of reasons, both internal and external. From the citizens' growing discontent to the mounting international pressure, the stage was ripe for change. The coup was orchestrated by the Yugoslav Air Force personnel, a group not just driven by their sense of patriotism, but also by their deep-seated dissatisfaction with the rule of Prince Paul. The Prince, 
who held the reins of Yugoslavia, was perceived as a mere puppet of the Axis powers, a sentiment that sowed seeds of rebellion amongst the ranks. With Prince Paul ousted, the Air Force personnel installed a new leader, a man who they believed would put Yugoslavia's interests first. This man was none other than Dusan Simović, a decorated army general known for his strategic acumen and strong leadership. The change in power, however, did not come without its challenges. The new regime was greeted with the colossal task of navigating the treacherous waters of World War II. The nation was caught in a tug of war between the Allies and the Axis, each vying to win over Yugoslavia to their side. Just four days after the coup, on March 25th, Prince Paul, in a desperate bid to regain power, offered his allegiance to the Axis by signing the Tripartite Pact. This was a move that sent shockwaves across the globe, further complicating the already turbulent political landscape. But the Yugoslavian government, now under the leadership of Simović, was quick to counteract. It formally signed its support for the Axis powers, a move that was seen as a clear rejection of Prince Paul's desperate overture. However, as history has shown us time and again, in a world at war, even allegiances are fleeting, and every day brings a new challenge. In the days that followed, the Yugoslavian government would find itself grappling with a new threat, the wrath of a certain German leader who had decided to destroy Yugoslavia. But that, my friends, is a tale for another day. March 27th, the British forces push Italians to retreat in the Battle of Karen, while on the high seas, U.S. vessels capture 65 Axis-aligned ships. In the heart of Eritrea, the Battle of Karen rages on. The British forces, against all odds, push the Italians into a hard-fought retreat. The significance of this victory can't be overlooked. The British not only reclaim vital territory but also deal a blow to the Italian morale and their hold on East Africa. The Battle of Karen is a testament to the tenacity of the Allied forces. Despite being outmanned and outgunned, the British forces utilize their strategic advantage, making use of the rugged terrain to their benefit. This victory bears witness to the sheer determination and grit of the Allied forces, a beacon of hope in the grim backdrop of the war. While the ground battle unfolds in Eritrea, a different kind of warfare is taking place on the high seas. The United States Navy, in a daring move, captures 65 ships aligned with the Axis powers. This action goes beyond just disrupting the Axis supply lines. It sends a clear message to the world. The United States is ready to take the fight to the Axis powers. The capture of these ships is a strategic masterstroke. It not only weakens the Axis powers, but also bolsters the Allied forces, providing them with much-needed resources. The impact of this action is felt far beyond the immediate gain of the ships. It boosts the morale of the Allied forces and sends ripples of concern through the Axis ranks. These two events, unfolding thousands of miles apart, are connected by a common thread the unwavering resolve of the Allies. In the face of seemingly insurmountable odds, they fight back, pushing the Axis powers on the back foot. In the face of adversity, the Allies push back, gaining ground in Eritrea and seizing control on the seas. As March draws to a close, unrest in Yugoslavia prompts the Germans to plan an invasion. The seeds of this decision were sown on March 26th, when Hitler, in a meeting with his high-level officers, reportedly declared his intent to destroy Yugoslavia. The cause? A coup just days earlier had seen Prince Paul, an ally to the Axis, forcibly removed from power. The new ruler, Dusan Simović, was quick to break Yugoslavia's commitment to the Axis powers, leaving Hitler with a new enemy in the Balkans. In response, the Germans swiftly drew up plans for an invasion, known as Directive No. 25. This was not a decision taken lightly. It was a strategic move aimed at securing Germany's southern flank and asserting dominance over the volatile region. As the month of March ends, a new threat looms over Yugoslavia, setting the stage for the next chapter of World War II. Picture this, the start of April 1941. Asmara, an Italian stronghold, crumbles under British might. Nestled in the highlands of Eritrea, Asmara was a jewel in the crown of the Italian Empire, a symbol of might and control. Its fall to the British forces was a significant blow to the Axis powers, marking a turning point in the East African campaign. Meanwhile, the night sky of Emden, a German port city, was lit up as six Wellington bombers flew overhead. These British aircraft, known for their resilience, carried a deadly payload targeted at the heart of the German naval infrastructure. The bombing of Emden was a daring operation, 
a strategic move designed to disrupt German maritime activities and weaken their naval strength. As the dust settled, the world braced for more. Little did they know, this was just the beginning. Meanwhile, a storm was brewing in Iraq. The British-friendly government was no more. The first 18 days of April, 1941 were marked by a tumultuous internal unrest. The echoes of discord resonated across the nation, culminating in a dramatic overthrow of the pro-British government. No longer would the Union Jack fly high over the Iraqi skies. The winds of change ushered in a new regime, a government that looked towards the Axis powers for alignment. A subtle shift, yet one that would have far-reaching implications. The new government's decision was like a ripple in a pond, its effects spreading outwards, reaching the furthest corners of the globe. This alignment wasn't just a political maneuver, it was a statement. A statement that reverberated through the halls of power from London to Berlin, Washington to Tokyo. With this shift, the tides of war were about to turn dramatically. As Iraq shifted alliances, Operation Rhinubung was being planned under the watchful eyes of Grand Admiral Reeder. This was not a simple operation, but a meticulously designed strategy. A stroke of genius that called for direct hit-and-run engagements with British merchant shipping across the vast expanse of the Atlantic. Operation Rhinubung was a daring plan, a game of cat and mouse intended to disrupt the lifeline of the British Empire. The German Navy, under Reader's command, was tasked with the mission to strike at the heart of the British merchant fleet. The goal was simple, sink the ships, disrupt the supplies, and weaken the British war effort. Meanwhile, over in North Africa, General Erwin Rommel was on the move. Known as the Desert Fox for his cunning strategies and unpredictable tactics, Rommel was advancing at a pace that was both relentless and surprising. His target, Ejidabia, a region of strategic importance. Why Ejidabia, you may ask? Well, Ejidabia held a significant position. It was a junction point, a crossroads that provided access to various key locations in North Africa. If Rommel could secure Ejidabia, he could control the flow of supplies and reinforcements, giving him a significant advantage over the British. Rommel's forces reached Ejidabia, and the Desert Fox did not disappoint. His strategy was bold, his execution flawless. He cut through the defenses like a hot knife through butter, securing the region and establishing a stronghold that would prove vital in the battles to come. Operation Reynubung and Rommel's advance in Agadabia were two different strategies on two different fronts. Yet, they were part of the same war, the same grand plan to disrupt, to destabilize and to defeat. With every move, the stakes were rising higher. Come April 6th, Operation Merida was set into motion, a dual invasion that would shake the very foundations of Greece and Yugoslavia. A grand total of 24 divisions, including over 1,200 tanks, were involved in this massive military movement. The landscapes of Greece and Yugoslavia were about to be drastically altered by the relentless march of German forces. In the midst of the chaos, Rommel, a name that had become synonymous with strategic brilliance, continued his relentless advance. His destination was Makili, another dot on the map soon to be engulfed by the storm of war. This invasion wasn't just a show of force though, it was a strategic maneuver designed to tighten the grip of the Axis powers over Europe. Greece and Yugoslavia were key pieces in a larger geopolitical puzzle, and their fall would have significant implications for the balance of power in the region. Meanwhile, the British forces in Greece, numbering 58,000, were about to face a test of their resolve. The coming days would bring battles that would echo through the annals of history, as each side vied for control over this vital region. As Rommel marched on, the world held its breath. The outcome of these invasions would not just determine the fate of Greece and Yugoslavia, but could potentially tip the scales of the entire war. The stakes couldn't be higher. Two days later, a reign of terror fell on Belgrade and the Metaxas line fell to the relentless German advance. The Yugoslavian capital city was subjected to a massive bombing raid. The onslaught was not just devastating, it was catastrophic. Over 300,000 civilians, people who had no part in the war, were caught in the crossfire. Their lives were extinguished in a storm of incendiary ordnance that turned their city into a pyre. Meanwhile, the Greek defensive line known as the Metaxas Line was fighting its own battle. The 12th German army encircled and defeated the Greek forces. This was not just a military setback, it was a psychological blow. The Greeks had put their faith in the Metaxas Line, a bulwark against German invasion. But in the face of a relentless enemy, 
even the strongest defenses crumbled. The German army pushed on capturing the strategic port city of Salonika. This was a significant victory. It was not just a city they had taken but a gateway to the Aegean Sea, a crucial point on the map of Europe. With Salonika under German control the world was left reeling. The month of April 1941 was a dark chapter in the annals of World War II. It was a time of grim milestones and devastating losses. But it was also a time when the resilience of the human spirit was put to the ultimate test. Picture this. It's April 10th, 1941. The crisp mountain air is heavy with tension, as three divisions of British, Australian and New Zealand troops brace themselves at the Aliakmon Line in the Versen Mountains. These men, hailing from opposite corners of the globe, stood united against a common enemy. They were the bulwark, the last line of defense in a world tearing at the seams. The Aliakmon Line, a formidable defensive position, was their stronghold, the rugged terrain of the Versen Mountains, their shield. But the enemy was relentless. For six grueling days they held their ground, fighting with every ounce of their courage and resilience. But courage, as valiant as it may be, was not enough to hold back the tide of war. The enemy pushed forward, their numbers overwhelming, their firepower devastating. By April 16th, the Aliakmon line had fallen, and the Allied troops were in full retreat. Meanwhile, on April 12th, the Yugoslavian capital of Belgrade is under siege. The city is surrounded by an overpowering force, a coalition of German troops launching from Romania, Austria, Hungary, and Bulgaria. They are joined by an Italian contingent from Albania, creating an encircling net of steel and fire. The air is filled with the thunderous roar of artillery and the whine of dive bombers as the Axis powers press their assault. Despite the brave efforts of the city's defenders, the sheer weight of the invaders' numbers and firepower is simply too great. Street by street, building by building, the enemy forces inch their way into the heart of the city. The resistance is fierce, but the outcome is inevitable. By the day's end, Belgrade had fallen into the hands of the Axis powers. A somber silence descends upon the city, marking the end of one chapter and the beginning of another in the saga of World War II. Two days later on April 14th, the German army made a decisive move at the Monastar Gap. This once peaceful pass, nestled in the rugged terrain of Yugoslavia, transformed into a battleground that would echo through time. The German forces with their relentless blitzkrieg tactics decimated the Yugoslavian forces, clearing a path into Greece. The Greek units, engaged in battle in Albania, found themselves cut off. The once united front was now fragmented, leaving the Greeks in a dire situation. The Greek soldiers with their backs against the wall fought with the spirit of their ancestors, but it was a battle they couldn't win alone. The Greek general Alexander Papagos, a man of strategic mind and fierce patriotism, was faced with a heartbreaking dilemma. His country, the cradle of democracy and philosophy, was on the brink of total destruction. The enemy was at the gates, and decisions had to be made. Papagos knew that continuing to fight would only result in more loss and devastation. He also knew that retreat was not an act of cowardice, but a strategic move to preserve what was left of his beloved country and its people. And so, with a heavy heart, he made his decision. He requested a full retreat. It was a desperate plea for survival, a plea that reached the ears of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Churchill, a man known for his steely resolve and fiery speeches, understood the gravity of the situation. The Greek plight resonated with him and he accepted Papagos's request. On April 16th, in the face of overwhelming adversity, the Allied forces in Greece began their retreat. The retreat was not a defeat, but a strategic withdrawal, a chance to regroup and fight another day. As the Allied forces retreated, they left behind a Greece that was on the brink, a Greece that would soon face its darkest hour. Yet in this darkness, the spirit of the Greek people would shine brighter than ever, illuminating the path toward their eventual liberation. The next day, April 17th, marked a grim milestone as the Yugoslavian leadership and the army surrendered to the Germans. The dominoes of resistance were falling one by one, giving way to the relentless march of the Axis powers. Amidst this bleak panorama, the British forces made a strategic move on April 18th. They arrived in Iraq intending to safeguard their vital oil supply chain, a lifeline in the brutal theater of war. Just two days later, another blow was dealt. The Greek army, having fought valiantly, found themselves cornered. The magnitude of their situation was daunting and the inevitable happened. 
On April 20th, Greece surrendered to the Germans and Italians. The olive branches of this ancient land, once symbols of peace, were now overshadowed by the ominous symbols of the Axis powers. By April 20th, Greece had surrendered to the Axis powers, marking a dark chapter in the annals of history. On April 25th, Hitler issued Führer Directive No. 28 calling for the invasion of the island of Crete. This marked the birth of Operation Mercury, a daring airborne invasion orchestrated by General Kurt Student. It was a bold move, a gamble of sorts, as the Germans sought to seize control of the Mediterranean and further tighten their grip on Europe. Just a day later, German airborne elements launched an audacious attempt to capture the bridge over the Corinth Canal. This was a strategic move, designed to encircle the retreating Allies. However, the bridge was lost in the attack, and the Allies had already moved on, evading the German trap. Meanwhile, in the shadows, Allied codebreakers were working tirelessly. Their efforts bore fruit when they intercepted word of the impending German invasion of Crete. This crucial piece of intelligence was a glimmer of hope in the gathering storm, a chance to prepare and perhaps turn the tide of the battle. On April 27, Axis forces officially occupied Athens, signaling the end of Greek resistance. The once vibrant city fell silent under the oppressive weight of the Axis occupation. Yet even as the Axis forces reveled in their victory, the Allies were not idle. Operation Demon was activated between April 27 and 30. This was a large-scale evacuation, covering the retreat of some 51,000 Allied troops from southern Greece via the Royal Navy. It was a complex and dangerous operation fraught with risk, but it was a necessary gamble to preserve the strength of the Allied forces. As the month of April drew to a close, a new leader took command of the Allied forces based on Crete. Major General Bernard Freiburg, a seasoned and respected officer, assumed command on April 30th. His arrival marked a new chapter in the unfolding drama of World War II and set the stage for the upcoming Battle of Crete. By April 30th, Major General Bernard Freiburg had assumed command of the Allied forces based on Crete, setting the stage for the upcoming Battle of Crete. A battle that would test the resolve of the Allies and the mettle of the Axis, and whose reverberations would echo through the annals of history. Picture this, it's May 9th, 1941. The seas are rough, the air is tense, HMS Bulldog is on a mission. The grey waters of the North Atlantic churn beneath the sturdy hull of the British destroyer. She's on a mission of paramount importance, a mission that could potentially change the course of World War II. At the heart of this operation is the capture of the German submarine U-110. Now this isn't just any submarine. Hidden within its steel body lies a treasure more valuable than gold or diamonds. The Enigma Code Machine. This little device with its complex array of rotors and plugs holds the key to the Germans' encrypted communications. If the British can get their hands on it, they could decipher the enemy's plans. It's a game of high stakes, and even higher tensions. With unwavering determination, HMS Bulldog and her crew managed to capture the U-110. As they board the submarine, the weight of their task settles heavily on their shoulders. In their possession now is the first Enigma machine. This is a monumental achievement, one that could potentially tip the scales in favor of the Allies. Back on British soil, the codebreakers set to work, their minds whirring as they try to crack the complex codes. The task is Herculean, but the potential rewards are immense. If they succeed, they'll have a window into the enemy's plans, a strategic advantage like no other. Little did they know this was just the beginning of a series of significant events that would unfold in May 1941. Fast forward to May 15th, our scene shifts to the sandy terrains of North Africa. Here, the British were gearing up to launch Operation Brevity, a tactical maneuver aimed at dislodging Rommel's dug-in forces. As the sun rose, the British forces, armed with determination and courage, rolled out, their eyes set on the horizon. However, the desert was a harsh mistress. The unforgiving heat and the shifting sands were as formidable as the enemy they were poised to face. Rommel, a seasoned desert fox, had anticipated this move. His forces were prepared, dug in, and ready to repel any assault that came their way. The British forces pushed on, their tanks kicking up clouds of dust. But their progress was slow. The enemy was well entrenched, and the territorial advantages were all in Rommel's favor. The British forces met with stiff resistance at every turn. Despite their best efforts, the British could only make little headway. The battle was far from over. They knew the war was a marathon, not a sprint. 
the desert was yet to reveal its final outcome. Now imagine the date is May 19th. The RAF fighters are being relocated. A sense of anticipation hangs in the air. The year is 1941. A strategic decision is made by the Allies. RAF fighters, the backbone of the British air defense, are being relocated. Destination? Egypt. Why Egypt, you ask? Well, it's a tactical move, a move to ensure their safety away from the escalating conflict. Meanwhile, the codebreakers, the unsung heroes of the war, are hard at work. They intercept a piece of information that sends ripples through the Allied ranks. It's a word, a code name, Operation Mercury. Operation Mercury, as they would soon learn, was the German plan for an airborne invasion of the island of Crete. And the most chilling part, it was set to commence the very next day. The clock was ticking, the countdown had begun. You could almost feel the urgency in the air, the tension building. The Allies, now forewarned, begin their preparations. They had intercepted the plans, but the question remained, could they intercept the invasion? And so, the stage was set. Crete, a tranquil Mediterranean island, was about to be thrust into the throes of war. The invasion was imminent, the stakes were high, and time was running out. As the hours ticked by, the preparations were made. Defenses were bolstered, strategies were discussed, and troops were mobilized. The island braced itself for the onslaught that was to come. Each passing moment brought them closer to the dawn of a new day, a day that would be marked by the echoes of war. The island, once a haven of peace, was about to become a battleground. As the sun set on May 19th, the stage was set for Operation Mercury. The battle for Crete was about to begin. The island, its people, and the brave soldiers defending it were about to be tested like never before. But one thing was certain, they wouldn't go down without a fight. They were ready, prepared to face whatever lay ahead, and determined to defend their island to the very end. As the sun set on May 19th, the stage was set for Operation Mercury. Dawn of May 20th, the air is filled with the roar of engines. Operation Mercury is underway. The stage for this operation was Crete, a beautiful island sitting in the Mediterranean Sea. The players, the German airborne troops and the Allied forces, ready to defend the island at all costs. Imagine the scene. As the sun rose, the sky was filled with German transport planes. The Allies, ever vigilant, were quick to respond. Flak teams defending their positions managed to destroy up to 50% of these invading aircraft in just the first few hours of the operation, a testament to the preparedness and resilience of the Allied forces. Despite the heavy losses, the German forces pressed on. Soon after 7 in the morning, the first German paratroopers, also known as the Fallschirmjager, landed near Malem and Kanya. They were followed by a second wave, taking off from Greece towards drop zones in Crete, between 1.30 and 2 in the afternoon. However, this second wave met the same fate as the first, their in-air losses nearly equaling those of their predecessors, thanks to the stellar Allied flak defenses on Crete. By 2 in the afternoon, the second wave of German paratroopers had landed around Heracleion and Rethymnon, but progress was slow. Many strategic positions remained out of German control. The first day of the German invasion of Crete was proving to be a tough battle. Meanwhile, away from the chaos of Crete, the German heavy cruisers KMS Prince Eugen and the battleship KMS Bismarck quietly left port for the North Sea, their destination and purpose unknown. A subtle reminder that war was not just raging in Crete, but across the globe. As the day ended, the outcome of these events was still uncertain. The world waited, holding its breath for what was to come. Imagine this. It's May 21st, 1941. A German offensive is underway against Heraklion. As the sun rises, the German army is pushing towards Heraklion, a strategic point on the island of Crete. But they're not met with open arms. No, they're met with the fierce resistance of 8,000 dug-in Allied soldiers. These brave souls, entrenched in their positions, are ready to defend their ground at all costs. Meanwhile, other elements of the German army are attempting a different approach. They're trying to reach Crete via the sea, but the mighty Royal Navy is not about to let that happen. Like a hawk swooping down on its prey, the Navy intercepts the German troops. The sea turns into a chaotic battleground, the air filled with the deafening sounds of gunfire and explosions. When the smoke clears, only 60 of these German soldiers are left standing. It's around this time that the British Navy receives some unsettling news. The German warship activity in the North Sea is increasing, this is not a good sign. It's clear that the Germans are planning something big, something that could tip the scales of the war in their favor. 
In response to this threat, the British Navy calls two of its most formidable vessels to action, the aircraft carrier HMS Victorious and the battlecruiser HMS Repulse. These titanic ships, under the command of Admiral Sir John Tovey, are sent to bolster the Royal Navy's presence in the North Sea. Their mission, to keep the German warship activity in check, to protect their homeland, and to ensure the victory of the Allies. So, as the first day of the Battle of Crete draws to a close, the Allied forces have made their stand. They've shown their strength and their determination to resist the German advance. And the German soldiers? Well, they've learned a hard lesson. Just 60 German soldiers live to see another day. May 22nd, a day of loss and resilience. In the throes of war, the HMS Greyhound, a British destroyer, met a tragic end. German bombers swooped down from the heavens, their deadly cargo finding its mark and sending the Greyhound to a watery grave. But the spirit of the Allies wasn't easily quashed. On that same day, New Zealand troops mounted a daring attempt to retake the airfield at Malame from the Germans. Their efforts, though valiant, were met with stiff resistance. Back in the North Sea, a formidable force was gathering. A hunter-killer group of 14 Royal Navy ships, including the mighty battleships HMS King George V, HMS Hood, and HMS Prince of Wales, left their anchorage at Scarpa Flow. They set out steaming towards the horizon, their mission clear, to confront the increasing German warship activity. But the day ended with a sobering realization. The battle was far from over. May 23rd, a day of destruction. The sun had barely risen when disaster struck the Royal Navy. Four of its frontline vessels, the HMS Kelly, HMS Kashmir, HMS Gloucester, and the HMS Fiji were under attack. German dive bombers like birds of prey swooped down from the skies, unleashing a torrent of destruction that would reverberate through history. The HMS Kelly and HMS Kashmir, two destroyers that had been the pride of the Royal Navy, were the first to meet their fate. They were formidable ships, engineered for battle, but even they were no match for the relentless assault from the German bombers. Their defenses were shattered, their hulls torn apart, and in a matter of minutes, they were reduced to sinking debris. In the same vein, the HMS Gloucester and the HMS Fiji, two proud cruisers of the Royal Navy, were also targeted. They too faced the wrath of the German dive bombers. Despite their best efforts to retaliate, they were overwhelmed. Their once formidable silhouettes were consumed by flames and smoke, and they too joined their sister ships in a watery grave. Yet amidst the chaos and destruction, a ray of hope pierced through. The Royal Navy cruisers, HMS Suffolk and HMS Norfolk, were on a mission. They had spotted the mighty German battleship Bismarck, a behemoth of steel and firepower. The Bismarck was not just any ship, it was the pride of the German fleet, a symbol of their naval might, but now its location was known, and the tables were beginning to turn. The Suffolk and the Norfolk shadowed the Bismarck, keeping a safe distance, but never letting it out of their sight. They radioed in its location to Vice Admiral L.E. Holland, setting the stage for the epic confrontation that was to follow. The mighty Bismarck was now on the radar. The day of destruction had passed, but the Royal Navy was not defeated. They had lost four ships, brave men had been lost, but their spirit remained unbroken. They were ready to fight, ready to face the Bismarck, ready to write history. May 24th, the day the Bismarck fell under attack. As dawn broke, the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen found themselves in the crosshairs of the Royal Navy. The British battleships, with their guns primed and ready, opened fire on the German vessels. The battle was fierce. At six in the morning, the Bismarck retaliated, firing a salvo that found its mark on the HMS Hood. The Hood's ammunition magazine was hit, and the resulting explosion was catastrophic. The mighty Hood, pride of the British fleet, was no more. The explosion was so intense it left only three sailors alive, a chilling testament to the brutal power of the Bismarck's guns. But the fight was far from over. The battleship Prince of Wales, though damaged, stood its ground. It bravely traded fire with the Bismarck, but by 13 minutes past six, the damage it had sustained forced it to withdraw from the battle. The Bismarck had shown its might, and the British fleet had paid the price. Meanwhile, the HMS Suffolk, tasked with shadowing the Bismarck, suddenly lost sight of the German battleship. In the chaos of the battle, the Bismarck had slipped away. But even as the seas quieted and the smoke cleared, 
one thing was certain. The Bismarck had slipped away, but not for long. May 25th, the end of a fierce battle. As the echoes of war began to fade, a final order was given. German Admiral Lutyens, in a strategic move, commanded the Prince Eugen to break away from the Bismarck. This decision marked the end of an intense chapter in the annals of World War II, a saga etched in the tumult and turmoil of battle. And so the tumultuous events of late May 1941 came to a close, leaving behind a trail of destruction and tales of bravery. Imagine this, the date is May 26, 1941, a time when the world was embroiled in the throes of World War II. A British Coastal Command PBY Catalina flying boat, scanning the vast ocean, finally spots the elusive KMS Bismarck, 700 miles from Brest. The Royal Navy's hunter-killer group, anxiously awaiting this moment, springs into action. Reinforcements arrive in the form of the HMS Renown, HMS Sheffield, and the HMS Ark Royal, sailing in from Gibraltar. As the day wears on, tension mounts. At 10 minutes to 3 in the afternoon, an attack group from the HMS Ark Royal gets the green light, their weapon of choice? Ferry swordfish biplane torpedo bombers. Each aircraft armed with a lethal payload takes to the skies, their target, the Bismarck. The bombers descend upon the German battleship, their engines roaring. Between the hours of 8.47 and 9.25 in the evening, the Bismarck takes two direct torpedo hits. The once invincible battleship shudders under the impact. In a stroke of luck for the British, the second torpedo finds its mark on the stern section of the Bismarck. The impact is catastrophic. The rudder jams to one side, sending the ship into an uncontrolled turn. The mighty Bismarck, once the pride of the German Navy, is now a wounded beast spiraling out of control. The Royal Navy seizes the moment. Their ships, armed with long-range guns, open fire on the crippled Bismarck. The once formidable Bismarck, now rendered helpless, was at the mercy of the Royal Navy's guns. The hunt for Bismarck had taken a decisive turn. The hunter was now the hunted. The stage was set for a battle that would go down in the annals of naval warfare. The next day, May 27, 1941, dawned with the promise of a decisive battle. Over in Greece, the German army was making strides. They successfully seized Heracleon and its strategically important airfield. Meanwhile, the Allied forces found themselves in retreat, pulling back to defensive positions at Galatas. Simultaneously, out in the Atlantic, the Royal Navy was closing in on its prey. The German battleship Bismarck. The once mighty vessel was now crippled, her rudder jammed to one side by a lucky torpedo hit from the day before. This forced the ship into an uncontrolled turn and left her vulnerable to the approaching British warships. At 8.47 a.m., the Bismarck began to feel the full force of the Royal Navy's assault. She was raked from front to rear by the guns of the British warships. The battleships HMS King George V and HMS Rodney led the charge, unleashing their short-range armament on the beleaguered German ship. Despite the ferocity of the attack, the Bismarck held out for over an hour, but by 10 a.m., her guns fell silent. The German battleship was critically damaged, taking on water and burning. As the minutes ticked by, the situation on board the Bismarck grew increasingly dire. The damage was too severe, and the ship could not be saved. At 10.36 a.m., the once formidable Bismarck made her final plunge into the blue depths of the Atlantic. The sinking of the Bismarck marked a significant moment in the Battle of the Atlantic. Of the over 2,000 men who had been aboard, only 115 survived. These men were the lucky ones, the ones who lived to tell the tale of the mighty Bismarck and her final fateful battle. At 10.36 a.m., the once mighty Bismarck disappeared beneath the blue depths, leaving only 115 survivors to tell her tale. May 28, 1941, brought with it a new challenge for the Allied forces. As the German army tightened its grip on Crete, the Allies faced a difficult decision. Major General Freiburg, a man of iron will and strategic acumen, made the call. It was time for a retreat, a gradual withdrawal of Allied troops from the island of Crete. Not a decision made lightly, but a necessary one, to preserve their forces for battles yet to come. Two major junctions would serve as the lifelines of this mass exodus, Heracleion in the north and Sphakia in the south. Both locations with their strategic positioning were chosen to orchestrate this enormous task of evacuation. From these points, waves of men were ferried away, leaving behind the land they had fought so hard to protect. Simultaneously, another significant event was unfolding on the vast expanse of the Atlantic. 
The first escorted convoy, codenamed HX-129, embarked on a perilous journey across the ocean. This marked a new chapter in the Allies' naval strategy, as they sought to protect their crucial supply lines from the ever-looming threat of German U-boats. As the last boats left the shores of Crete and the convoy braved the Atlantic, the fate of the war hung in the balance. The brave men of the Allied forces began their retreat from the island, leaving it open to the advancing German army. By May 30th, the defense of Rathimnon by Australian soldiers was faltering under the relentless pressure of the German forces. The brave Australians, far from home, were holding the line in the face of an unyielding enemy. In the narrow streets and amidst the ancient ruins of Rathimnon, they stood their ground, courage in their hearts, and resolve in their eyes. The battle was fierce, the enemy relentless. The Australians, outnumbered and outgunned, fought with a tenacity that was as admirable as it was heartbreaking. They fought not just for their lives, but for the freedom and dignity of the Cretans they had come to protect. However, even the bravest of hearts falters under the weight of overwhelming odds. On that fateful day, the defense of Rathimnon crumbled, not due to a lack of courage or strength, but due to the sheer force of the German assault. The soldiers, weary and defeated, were forced to retreat, leaving behind a city now under the shadow of the swastika. In the final days of May, the rest of Crete fell. The island, once a beacon of hope for the Allies in the Mediterranean, was now a German fortress. The beautiful beaches, the ancient ruins, the picturesque villages, all were now under the iron grip of the invaders. By the end of May, Crete was no longer a battleground, but a German stronghold. The island had fallen, but the memory of those brave days of resistance would live on a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who fought for freedom. On a quiet morning, June 22, 1941, the winds of change blew across Europe. Operation Barbarossa, a secret plan by Germany, sprung into action. The mighty Soviet Union, a sleeping bear, was caught off guard by this unexpected invasion. Just a week later, on June 29, two German generals, Guderian and Hoth, met in Minsk. Their forces, like iron fists, encircled the brave Russian soldiers in key Soviet cities. The stage was set, tensions ran high, and the fate of these embattled cities hung in the balance. Caught in the midst of this whirlwind were the soldiers, ordinary men thrown into extraordinary circumstances. From the rumble of tanks to the echo of artillery, they stood their ground, their resolve unshaken. What would become of them? What would become of the world? The answers, as always, lay in the hands of time.